very in-depth. Um, what do you, uh, yeah, and then maybe we can start, uh, we can jump over to Benny, um, so she can share a little bit more about how, Benny, you, you plan to use the experiences, um, what you've been working on currently um, in China right now, back um, in your home country, um, and, I, and as I understand, you already have a business. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, sorry, I, can you repeat the question? You know, I just had a baby and um, some of the times <laughs> we have been distracted with taking care of us. So, no worries. Um, um, thanks, for, thanks for joining, even though you're taking care of this baby. Um, the, the, the question was, to kind of Daniel's point, um, you know, with taking you know, the, the students going back to China, um, you know, as absorbing all this information and then going back to Africa. Um, what are what are you planning to do um, with your your PhD um, as well as because I, from my understanding, you already have a business. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how what your schooling and your education in China has so far impacted um, what you're doing or planning to do? Well, um, the nature of the program is once you're done with your program, you're expected to go back to your country. You know, there should be a feedback relationship. So it shouldn't be that um, they believe that you coming over to China, you should be able to learn a lot, then go back and um, impact the knowledge you've acquired so far. And in my own case, um, the issue in Nigerian agriculture is that most of the farmers have low yield. You know, it's not that they are lazy, they're actually hardworking and they have, they try to provide their resources themselves, but there's still a limitation because the yield um, expectation is still very low. So, and, and at the end of the day, the income they expect is still not, um, they don't still meet up the needed income they have. So when I found or got this opportunity, like I found it very useful because one, China has really advanced in their agricultural sector and the farmers as well has really, you know, gotten to the stage of beating the, the profit margin. The, the objective of every business is to make profit and most of the Chinese farmers have gotten to that stage where they can say like, I have gone ha more than my profit margin. So I found it needful to, you know, take part in the, apply for the scholarship and really learn, not just for my own good, because as a farmer too, I, I, I experienced such losses. Sometimes the input in producing a particular good or both in livestock and in crop, you find that, that the input, the calculated expectation is not what you get. At the end of the day, what you get is, is more like you, you're selling off just for you not to get lost at all, just to acquire back your capital. And that's why most people, once they try a little in agriculture, because of they are not meeting up their demands, they, they back off except few that have passion for agriculture, so they still remain there. So the importance of my program or the program is that um, they try to teach you most of the system or most of um, the researches they've done so far that helped them improve in their agricultural sector. For instance, they said the major problem China, the Ch China had was they had high input in, ag in um, chemicals like fertilizers, fungicides, and all what, and herbicides. Why in Nigeria, let me use Nigeria as a case study since I come from there and I know a little about the Nigerian agriculture. We are not used, we, we don't, we've not even used half of the fertilizer or chemical I think we lost her. Usually I'm the one, cause I'm in Nairobi. Um, the joke is every time I have a webinar, uh, the power has to go out. So like, there's always a point at some point where everything goes dark, but uh, it's lucky that we're at the middle of the day. Okay, let's uh, wait one more sec until Benny comes back on. Otherwise, I'm coming back to you, um, Kofi. 
Um, okay, let, let's, let's go with this, this question first. Um, and then if she comes back on, then we'll, we'll have her finish her answer. Um, so Kofi, a lot of young people in the Africa China space feel like the most important decisions are being made by governments or older people. How can young people tangibly work to make these partnerships more sustainable? Okay. Um, this is this is a very interesting question because um, it has to do with the work that WIPA does. Um, we believe in strategically positioning youth and empowering them to um, improve food systems, to contribute fully as participants in the food systems. And in doing this, we believe that we also see, actually, that um, aside the work that is being done by WIPAD, there are, there are many initiatives being done to promote, um, to promote and strengthen youth-led um, youth enterprises and social interventions. So um, with these calls that are around, it's, it's very vital that youth pay attention to them and also respond to such calls when they are made. These are great opportunities for youth to build themselves and to position themselves as um, agents of change in the, in, in the food systems. And also one thing that YPAT stands for is to give the youth a voice. Now we believe that anything that is done for the youth without the youth is actually done to the youth. So whatever you do for the youth without the youth, you do to them. And this can even be classified as an offense. Um, <laughs> yes, because the youth know what they want. So there's this question of what do the youth want? This is a question that is being asked in every sector that is looking out to involve youth in their, in their work. A very good way to know what the youth want is to have youth themselves establish a credible knowledge base for their own use. So they'll be able to um, engage with governments and other institutions, which are usually run by older people. And these are the decision making bodies that that actually call the shots when it comes to making uh, charting the course for the future. And um, talking about this, I, I'd like to bring in, I'd like to bring in um, what, what YPAD and FARA, our host, YPAD Africa and, our, and FARA, our host, what we do together. We, we actually bring youth together on various platforms, on various levels to discuss what their challenges are, what their expectations are. And even more importantly, we, we see it important to document the experiences of youth as they go through various um, youth engagement initiatives. And this is a way of knowing where the gaps are in engaging youth, where the gaps are when, where it comes to policy. Because we also realize that um, in policy making, various, uh, many youth aren't really involved. So in gathering the youth's um, perspective, you're able to find out what is, what is lacking, what is needed, and actually what is being done well that, that, that is good for emulation in various initiatives and in this context, um, various Africa-China initiatives that are going on uh, will be able to document the, the, good, uh, the good practices that, that, that are able to, to make these sustainable. So um, basically, all we are saying that um, tangible work needs to be done around um, data gathering and organizing and processing and sharing, capturing the, sh capturing the knowledge that, that youth have. We can you do this through a, a process of experience capitalization and even capacity development. So we'd we'll be, we'll be very well informed on well-founded techniques to advance knowledge, skills, and attitudes that are good for um, application 
when it comes to the innovations that we are talking about, which would um, would be able to 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 facilitate the sustainable development that we all want in the China Africa space. Thank you so much, Kofi. Yeah, I th I think the conversation about the youth is so important, be particularly because Africa um, is the world's youngest continent, right? And the earlier that we involve youth in this decision making, when it sounds like is creating structures and organizations that are purposefully and intentionally giving uh, youth a voice, is absolutely fantastic. So thank you for all the work that you do um, at YPARD. Um, and unfortunately, um, I am coming to the end of my, my time as moderator um, for this session. Um, and we have a really exciting um, keynote coming up. Um, sorry, I'm just, okay, perfect. Um, and so we're just going to um, end with one um, quick kind of round, round robin. Um, and, and that's going to be, what is the one thing that um, will be most pivotal or important for sustainability um, within the context of China-Africa relations? Um, let's say just in the next five years. I don't wanna think about in the next decade or the next century. Um, I don't want it to be too abstract. So if we can each think of one really, really specific recommendation um, that you as experts in your field have, for increasing, uh, for heightening China-Africa sustainability. Um, who is ready to start? Any ideas? Okay, Daniel, go. Yeah, I'm happy to go. So I think I'll, I'll stick within my own within my own research because that's probably what I'm most qualified to comment on. I would say it's the cooperation among African academics to build awareness within the community as to the Africa-China relationship, especially within academia. The same way that workers working in a factory join a, a union so that they have a collective voice to bargain with their, um, to bargain with their employers. In a very similar way, this needs to happen with academia where researchers across all of the different African, you know, within countries, within universities, I think there is a, a serious need for them to, to band together so that they can share what their ex, share their experiences with with other people that will also be engaging in the China Africa space, and then through that gain a collective voice, which will then give them more power when when negotiating terms of these um, agreements and these relationships. Great, more collective power. Thank you so much, Daniel. Hassan, are you ready? Oh, wait, is that? Thank you. So I would really, in the sustainability of China, Africa, I would go for local content. African countries need to strengthen their local content regulations and try to see that um, if these infrastructure development projects are going on, let's have regulations and uh, say to guide and encourage local participation so that we have sustainable development where locals are also participating in that infrastructure construction improvements. I would also end with uh, strengthening debt management capacity. Let us try to be transparent, accountable, and also learn how to negotiate better terms and conditions. It's okay to go back and can we renegotiate, renegotiate these terms if something didn't go well. But otherwise, I think um, I really commend the Chinese government for trying to come in and fill this space, especially to close the infrastructure deficiency that uh, Africa is currently fa facing. Great, thank you so much, Hassan. Who's next? If I have to say, I would say the best thing would be for um, um, investment in research and development. Um, you know, there is there is no proper research in African countries, and that's just because of maybe let's say because of the low investment in research and development. And when proper when proper investments are being made, and 
proper research are done, there would be definitely um, rapid development in African countries. So um, that would be my contribution. Great. Kofi, you ready? <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Yeah. So um, one thing I'd mention, if I'm to mention one thing, then I'd say inclusivity. But if I'm supposed to add another one, then I'd also say that we should go on supporting innovations in the agricultural sector. And not only through the research breakthroughs in the lab, but also we should um, source innovations in processes at the local level and identify promising practices that can be validated into good practices. Yeah. Wow, that is a great sound bite. <laughs> I hope we make a little, a little video of that. Perfect. Um, okay, great. I want to open up the floor to um, any questions that our attendees uh, might have um, for the for the speakers. Um, you guys can either put it in the in the Q and A sections um, on the bottom of your uh, Zoom, or you can just uh, raise your hand, and I can give you permission to speak. Um, anyone have any questions for these wonderful? super insightful um, panelists that we have for today. Okay. Not seeing anything come up. Um, one of my favorite things to do on panels is actually to ask the panelists as they have questions for other panelists. Um, from a, oh, sorry. I can jump in if you, if that's okay. right. if you had more <laughs> yes, to say. Uh, Sorry, I thought you were finished. Go ahead. Um, so I, I'd be interested to hear from Hassan. When we're talking about debt and debt funded projects, um, normally we talk about that purely with a financial con context. But I think when dealing with China, it's quite clear that, that China has a very strong um, cultural and political political motivation as well in in this a, a couple of examples that come to mind you know are their only their willingness to only deal with countries in Africa that uh, recognize Beijing and, and don't recognize Taiwan um, for example and looking at the concession of the port in Hanban Tota in Sri Lanka that was one way that uh, all of a sudden, a financial issue was then, you know, very much turned into a, a, a political or a, a direct resource seizure, I guess. And so when looking at dealing with debt coming from China, how do you, how do you see, how can you draw the line, I guess? When does something become a, when, when does something stop being a financial issue? And when does something start being a, a, a cultural issue or a, um, an, an issue of, of national security, say? Great question. You should be a moderator next time. Yes, I, I think, actually, I was trying to think through that day before this, and you brought it up very well that uh, Chinese debt to Africa is really in two fronts. There is a commercial aspect and a policy aspect. And what is uh, maybe of concern, what you've noticed that um, the, Ch the policy aspect is normally through the China Exim Bank and the China Development Bank, the policy banks that are giving out these loans. It would not be purely for commercial reasons. It would be concessional debt, low interest, and you pay back to just help African countries develop the infrastructure because we know that uh, if infrastructure is developed, then there is demand. And it's a it's a win-win because China needs to have a better ally, someone with decent infrastructure, and maybe they are more interested in sh seeing that this infrastructure is developed. They're also interested in seeing that a people-to-people -people understanding and relationship is developed so they can provide finance or credit or debt that is affordable and not uh, very commercial to help maybe through programs that uh, promote this. But on the other side, we have seen that over time, the private debt 
is also increasing. The proportion of debt to African countries from China has the component of commercial and government. And you're seeing that uh, with time, the private component or the commercial, purely commercial component is coming and taking a bigger proportion. We are seeing private lenders like the ICBC, it's a state-owned bank, but uh, it is when it's dealing with uh, Africa to lend on purely commercial terms, the China Construction Bank and other state-owned enterprises that are dealing on a private level with African countries. So yes, it's true that uh, there can be risk because the commercial loans are quite expensive and may have more chances of default in case something happens compared to the policy or policy driven lending, maybe by the policy banks, because it is also easy actually to restructure or maybe really offer debt relief for this policy driven lending compared to private lending. For the issue of uh, national security or asset seizures, maybe sovereignty, yes, I think it has been thrown out around, especially by media and other people. But so far, we've seen that it's still a rumor because we've not seen it happen. And uh, we are yet to see it happen. The risk that has been identified would be Djibouti. But uh, Djibouti is also, you see that China has tried to do a lot of work in Djibouti, especially at the ports. They're trying to create special economic zones and uh, redeveloping the ports. And this comes with economic development. So the advantage, the plus is that uh, should this heavy infrastructure investment lead to a corresponding increase in economic growth, then the debt will surely be sustainable. It's a benefit to the African people and it's a win-win between China and Africa. The fear that is being touted around could be that what if we don't realize the actual value of this? And that's where maybe the default or risks of debt risks could come in, but we are not yet there. And so far, we, I don't think we are going to reach that extent for now. Great. Thank you so much, Hassan. Oh, hold on. I think this is going to rise. Okay, wonderful. So, with that, um, I'm going to wind down this wonderful panel. Um, the you know, I think one of the things I really appreciated um, today is um, is the fact that we were able to actually. Sorry, I see that actually there is there seems to be a question from. I'm not sure if this is a name or this is a. So D Agba, I'm gonna allow you to talk. Can you can you hear us? You should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't want to ask the question because there's some constructions here in the office. But if they do start, then I will have to, you'll just have to read my question. Um, my question is for the panel members, all of them. I'm very interested in research on sort of integrating new models for education, especially focused on the um, fourth industrial revolution uh, at lower level education, because we are always so focused about on the graduates, on the research that the graduates um, are doing. But I, I believe that in Africa, because we have such a younger aged generation, there is so much room for teaching them um, a very important sort of like tech uh, solutions or, yeah. So how can China and Africa work together to facilitate new quality education models focused on for IR, especially now looking at COVID crisis, because I know that a lot of schools in Africa really pan didn't know how to just integrate everything online quickly enough so that the students can continue to learn. Uh, so just looking at problem solving based and collaborative learning at lower level. Is there room for this? Could China and Africa look at this? You know, um, young people, younger, those that are, are not even in, in universities yet need what we are learning now at, in university. I, I graduated already. I'm working in China um, at the moment. So I just, I, I, I see that there's such a big need, a, a huge need for younger people to how can China and Africa integrate that? That is what I'm asking. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'm actually going to field that over to Kofi. 
Okay, yeah, I, I think that's a very good question. And then I'm sure it's something we'd also keep thinking about while we go through this and even after we've left here, because um, it's very important that we find a way through. But I think that the first step to this is when we're able to establish, um, how do I put this? We should be able to point out um, a common problem. So it's more like co-creation of capacity to define common problems. Because um, I believe it's easier, it's easier if we are able to point out our, our solutions through where, I mean, when I say our solutions, I mean, we as Africans, it will be able to point out our solutions and the way forward through um, recognizing where China was able to make it. So it's, it's basically, it's, it's not as simple as it sounds, but um, I'll just put it simple. Um, learning from where China just made it. Because um, listening to, listening to, um, is it? Our, our lady panel, I, I just <laughs> forgot her name. That's Benny? Bad. Benny, yes. Listening to Benny, you, you realize that she has also noticed that there are, there are so many high points with China, where China has improved. Um, basically, they have been where Africa is now. And even we in Africa are still um, thinking about our challenges with productivity. So that is, that is a good starting point. But also um, putting this in the context of academia, then um, maybe, I, I don't know, I wouldn't want to throw this to someone else, but I believe that with um, the best research being done by Daniel, I'm sure he may be able to help me out. Daniel, do you want to yeah, yeah, answer? Yeah, no, sorry. I'm just, every time scrambling, I think I'm trying to unmute myself at the, at the right moment. Um, so I, I would say the first thing, and uh, I can pass this on to Hassan as well, is the infrastructure is probably the, the, the biggest issue to come first. Dee, what it sounds like I think you're talking about is perhaps moving education online, like e-learning solutions and... Um, having uh, allowing younger students access to these sorts of resources is is, is that the sort of thing that you, you had in mind, Dee? Um, yeah, yes. I I'm looking at the different kind of models. Not e learning in Africa already exists uh, as mm. per my research, but now I'm talking about stuff like robotics and uh, things that Chinese students also sort of like start to know at an early age and that's why i think you're already answering my question by talking about infrastructure so you 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 sort of you do get what i'm i'm trying to ask because the four ir is um is a larger picture where the whole world is going into you know and so we already but there, there are there are a lot of challenges as i've read through a lot of articles in in, in sort of like um integrating it in the normal lives, especially in Africa. But uh, for in yeah, I'm done. Sorry, I talked too much. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't right. apologize. That's no, great. Yeah, I, so and that's, I guess, the instant for me, from, from my perspective, the institutions really, that's the institutions are what enable then the, the study and the learning about about those things. And so, you know, I would give one example in Nigeria, OAU, at um, OAU in uh, Ife, um, there was the Carnegie Foundation sponsored a uh, IT center for excellence. So that was about giving the university, giving OAU, Obafemi Oro University, access to um, excellent com compute computers and excellent high-speed internet and this sort of thing. And it, it's not so much, of course, you need to actually learn then how to use the computers, but really it's about what research and what study that those, that hardware, that those facilities then make possible. And so when it comes to 4IR, um, you need to have the building blocks already in place, right? 
in, in terms of, of what needs to be studied. Um, and so how, where, where does that fit in with Africa, China? Well, I think um, companies such as Huawei are obviously huge players where we've seen Huawei infrastructure being implemented already in a, a number of places across China. And so if there's some public private partnership then potentially between looking at um, getting uh, suitable funding arrangements for, for those sorts of projects, I would say um, projects like that would certainly be the most logical first step towards implementing for IR education. Um, it's just then a question of, you know, which is the overriding question of all of this. Um, how much debt is acceptable debt? How much um, control are you willing to concede to, to China in the process? And to what extent are you willing to allow your telecommunications network to, um, to have, have that, um, the, the, the Chinese um, aspect be a, be a part of it, which is like, that's not for me to answer, that's for, for, for Chinese countries to, to decide. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for your question, Dee. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry, is, is that, does that answer your question? Is that what you yes. were trying to... Yes, it does, yes, thank you. Yes, it does answer my question. Thank you, Kofi, thank you, Daniel. Thank okay. you, You're Stephanie. Welcome. I'm gonna allow for one more. Um, question. Uh, I know this comes from Duapa. I don't know actually who's speaking behind Duapa, but um, if the rest of you guys could just put your questions in the Q&A, that would be great. Thank you so much. Yeah, pop them in the, the Q&A and then maybe we can do a few of them at once. <laughs> Hello guys, can Hi. you hear me? Yeah. Yes, thank you. This is Musa here. Yeah. Um, hi, Stephanie. How are you? Good. Yeah. Go ahead with your question. Thank you, guys, for sharing. Um, one of the um uh, difficult works, and I know all of us working in this space, um, have that challenge. Is um, when you engage with China, when you engage with the Chinese side, um, you see how willing they are to exchange, uh, to engage, or to share with the African side. And uh, those of us who are trying to work in the space of people to people, um, education and employment, innovation, these are not um, the big issues. These are not the, where the billions and the millions of monies exist. And one of the challenge we have had is that, um, especially when you come to the African side, you, you have worked out a very smooth um, relationship or engagement with the Chinese side and we get to the African side to say this is what uh, we have um, agreed with the Chinese side can you guys come on board can you bring something on board so that um, this thing can work out and normally we have a challenge because when you come to the African side there's not that willingness or I, I don't know whether it's also um, there's a lot of understanding gap also existing but I want to ask how you think we can uh, bridge that gap um, uh, against the fact that uh, Africa side is also distracted with engagement with America, with engagement with Europe, with engagement with uh, the rest of the world. And China is trying to focus and uh, really pick high its relationship with uh, Africa. They are trying to prioritize that relationship. But we see that at, uh, from the African side, we lack that priority because we have that destructive patterns and options and all that. So how do you think the African side can really regroup themselves, prioritize themselves and, and see how strategic they can be when they are engaging with China instead of making it um, general, generalizing the relationship with China or trying to um, uh, be destructive about it. Um, so that would be my question to almost all the panelists. Great, I'm gonna field that over to Hassan. Thank you, Musa. And to be frank with you, I think African countries or African leaders, we need to see ourselves as a, a beautiful lady who's on a date with uh, <laughs> uh, China and other countries and we 
we have our interests that our crunch has this offer. We need to genuinely look at it and then compare it with the other offer from the other side. So at the end of the day, we need to know that our interests are maybe lying in infrastructure development, our interests lie in education, our interests lie in uplifting our people from poverty that is taking majority of the people. So how do we achieve that? China has been slightly more open and said, I need to do this. It's for a win-win. I do this, I, you get this. So they have been slightly more open and uh, they are willing to do a win-win relationship whereby they solve this in return for this. And uh, however, we are on the African side, I think we are not taking advantage of this openness and sincerity, I should say. So we need to maybe negotiate better, like you say. My principal recommendation would be approaching this relationship in a more unified way. Let's take advantage of the regional economic blocks we have. I will give you a scenario of the East African region. Uh, I think way back then in the early 2000s or 2009, 2010, the East African region conceived the idea of having an interconnected region with the standard gauge railways and where the railroad would run through Kenya, Uganda, South Sudan, Nairo, then uh, Rwanda, Tanzania, and in interconnect the entire region. However, when it reached the negotiation stage, I think when we reached to negotiate for funding with China, it was done on a case by case, country by country level. And uh, you find, you found what happened is that Kenya was able to negotiate and secure part of the SDR finance. For Uganda's case, up to now, it's still in limbo. I hope they could try to convince the government better, the Chinese government to better. So what has happened is that the SDR has been constructed in the Kenya, in the Kenyan side, but it's going to lie somewhere because Uganda has not secured the funding. Maybe because they are weak bargaining power, they didn't have that bargaining power. So I feel that that's something, a mistake we made as a region. If we would come together as one and say, okay, we are negotiating. This is a market of 120 million people plus, or this is a market of 200 plus million people. I think that's some kind of stronger bargaining power because uh, it's so difficult when a country like uh, Rwanda, maybe with a small market size and a GDP size is taking on or negotiating on a table with a bigger superpower. It's bound to happen that we are already at a less advantage. So Musa, to answer you, I would recommend we look at the aspect of approaching this negotiation as a block or regions. I hope the AFST, the, the continental trip, effect for the entire African country comes and we take advantage of it so that uh, and, uh, more reasonable terms and conditions for this finance we get because the one thing I'm sure China is ready and able to avail the finance but we are not doing the right negotiation we are not giving in the right concessions or the right terms and conditions and I think that's something we need to look at. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Hassan. Um, thank you so much to all the attendees. Um, and